become reprobate. We can fall away. It's my goal today to preach this message, how to make decisions in your life, how that we can take some of these characteristics of Daniel, that we might have joy in our life. And the joy comes through victory. Let me tell you, there's no, it's no fun losing a Super Bowl. I don't know if you've read any of the news media. When you go into the locker room of the winning team, jubilance, rejoicing. You go into the locker room of the losing team, let me tell you, it's no picnic. It's no fun in there. And I can't imagine a greater Super Bowl to lose than the Super Bowl of our spiritual life. Because we're either going to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or we're going to hear those words, depart from me and the everlasting fire. Now, there were many characters in the book of Daniel. Daniel, the man greatly beloved. Daniel, the great judge. The word Daniel means God is my judge. The theme of the book of Daniel is God's sovereignty. Christians will win. And Daniel 3.16, there's something about these three men. And uh, when you read the three stories, we have the story of the self-control of Daniel chapter 1, how they refused to eat uh, of the sinner's menu. Chapter 2, we have the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and how there was a death sentence upon all the prophets unless they could tell the dream and give the interpretation thereof. Daniel 2 is the metallic image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream Daniel's prophecy and the great victory that was accomplished through his interpretation of that prophecy, which is one of the greatest kingdom of God prophecies, Daniel chapter 2, that the kingdom of God, made without hands, would come about in the days of the fourth kingdom. Daniel chapter 2. We know the four kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And in the days of the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus, a decree went forth that all the world should be taxed. In the days of Claudius Caesar, there was a famine in the land prophesied in the book of Acts. In the days of Claudius, the Jews were expelled from Rome. Priscilla and Aquila had to flee. And the Bible picks them up with Paul in the city of Corinth. Luke chapter 3, it was in the days of Tiberius Caesar, backtracking a little bit, that the word of the Lord came to John, John the Baptist, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And finally, Colossians chapter 4, Paul said that they of Caesar's household greet you. Clearly, the New Testament church began in the days of that fourth kingdom. And so we have the the triumph of self-control, Daniel chapter 1. We have the great kingdom of God prophecy, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 3, there was an image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected made out of gold and At the sound of the music, every man, every person in the great assemblage should bow down to that image of Nebuchadnezzar. But there were three men who refused to bow. And of course, you know the story. Anybody that refused to bow to the image was going to be cast into the fiery furnace. And the fire, of course, represents the tribulation that every one of us Uh, must endure. In fact, it's almost as if God wants us to go through tribulation. God tests us. He wants to know what we're made of. Jesus said in the great passage of the, of the vine and the branches that even the vines that, that abide in Him, the vines that are attached uh, to the grapevine, the branches would have to be pruned so that they might bear even more fruit. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they were not exempt from that tribulation. The first thing that, as we put these three stories together, the first thing I want to draw to your attention is the resolution of mind. It's it's good to prepare beforehand and determine in our heart. Remember, Daniel, it says he purposed in his heart. These men purposed in their heart. The Bible says that, that we should give to the Lord as a man purposes in his heart. In the book of Corinthians, talking about if we sow sparingly, we'll reap sparingly. But if we sow abundantly, we will reap abundantly. But it says, let a man give as he's determined in his heart. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. And look at the fact that these men, when they were brought before the king, 
And they faced down the fiery furnace. They said, O oh, King, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Now, that's, that's not a bad translation. To paraphrase, what they're saying is, Lord, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to think. We don't need, you know, like on Jeopardy, they, you know, when they give the double Jeopardy question and they have a little clock and they have that little music, bum, 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 bum. You know, you've got to think it over before you give your answer. What Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saying, we don't need any time to think about it. Our minds have already been made up, and here's our verdict. Now, where did they get that resolution? Where did they get that conviction? You see, their perseverance was accomplished years before. It was developed. You can't wait till you get in the heat of the moment and then think that you're going to make the right decision for the Lord. This great showdown, the great verdict that they're going to give had come about long before when they had dedicated themselves to the Lord. They were faithful in little things. And that's what Jesus said. You've got to be faithful in the little things of life, and then I'll make you responsible for much. And it has a lot to do with the self-control they had in Daniel chapter 1. Even though they were orphans, their fathers probably were put to death. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and brought the youth. He had put to death the adults. He brought the youth into Babylon, into captivity. The commentators, probably these guys were eunuchs. They were eunuchs because they served in the king's palace. I mean, they had a lot of things that were, would, would hold them back. But let me tell you, no one would question the manhood of these four men. And I like it. Sometimes it's Daniel. Sometimes it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then sometimes it's Daniel and his three friends. I like the way the writer of Daniel ties these men together. But here's what they said. We don't need to think about this, O King Nebuchadnezzar. If we're thrown into the blazing fire, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But look at verse 18. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, that we will still, I had to add in there, we're still not going to serve you and bow down to your gods. Now, when's the last time that we got defiant like that for the Lord? I see so much defiance among teenagers. I see so much defiance, you know, in, in, with our young people. When's the last time we ever turned it around and got defiant to the devil on behalf of the Lord? God will save us. But if, even if he doesn't, we don't care. We're not bound down to your gods. Now, that's something to be admired. In other words, their minds were made up. That's what we call in the Bible be a man who has one mind, being one-minded, being like-minded. I would to God that we had that unity of mind in our congregation, that we would not waver in all of the personal decisions, all of the things that we have to do, all of the temptations, the trials. And how about the distractions? Maybe you're not being tempted. Maybe you're not being tried. But what about the distractions of life? Don't tell me that we're not distracted by the God of this world and tempted to put something else before the King of kings and Lord of lords and his kingdom. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Proto, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. You say, well, uh, what kind of a promise is that? All things aren't being added to me. Well, yeah, sometimes there's a breakdown. You know, and that's really between God and us to find out where the breakdown is, why these things aren't being added. And I'm talking about the things of life, the things that we need, our needs. In Sunday school class, one of my favorite stories in Genesis 28, when Jacob launched out and he had nothing but the shirt on his back. You know, the greatest times in the Dowdy family where when we moved to Harrisonburg and Bridgewater and lived in the humble Penny Lane apartments, and I knew it. I knew it at the time. At living, you know, living, uh, just uh, taking the risk for God. Everybody knows that to those who take the risk, share the blessing of the reward. You don't know if you're going to succeed or fail. And how many of us remember the days we were married and you had nothing except your I do's and your love and 
you know, your you, you, wives, women, you know, you, you talk to your husbands and said, what are we going to live on? And your husband said, we're going to live on love. And, and you said to your husband, yeah, but what are you going to live on? Because the paychecks weren't very big, but you know, we look back and, and we look at back at life and we see how vulnerable we were when we started out. Who was in control? Didn't the Lord bring us through those hard times, the times when we were the most vulnerable? And now we grow, get a little older and now we have our jobs and we've got a few uh, merits to show in, in, in this game of life. And, and we look back and all the hardships that we went, we went through and endured and we can see how God brought us through. And all the tribulations, every one of them, I mean, we can list them and write them on a sheet of paper. And every one of those problems came to pass. Why is it? Could it be because there is a God in heaven? Could it be the very same God who wrote the book of Daniel, the very same God whom Daniel served, and that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego loved? Could it very well be that he's the same God who's our God today? the God that we're trying to serve, the God that we are defiant for and whose uh, knees we shall never bow to any other God except Him. You think God is any less pleased when we refuse to, to bow our knee to the gods of Baal and the gods and the idols of this world? Let me tell you, the book of Daniel wasn't written for them. It was written for us. It was written for us, people upon whom the ends of the world have come. And beloved, I'm just, I'm just thrilled to the heart to think when Elijah was, came out of the slaying of the prophets of Baal, when, when fire came down from heaven, Elijah had just scored the greatest victory of all time. Not only did there, was there fire came down from heaven, consumed the priests of Baal, there were about 400 priests of Baal that were put to death. I mean, it was a, a total rout. I don't know why, but Elijah, after a great victory, you think he'd be happy, you think he'd be on top of the mountain. He actually went into the cave, and and he became despondent. He became depressed. The word got back to to Ahab and Jezebel, and Jezebel said, I'm going to get that prophet. I'm going to get that preacher. And here he had just called down fire from heaven, destroyed 450 priests of Baal, and he's afraid of Queen Jezebel. Now, shame on us. Shame on Elijah. Shame on us. We get in that cave and we lose our influence. You know, we have no, there's no influence in the cave. There's no influence in our cloister. We've got to get out. The ship isn't meant to stay in harbor. It's meant to sail the seven seas. Commerce, industry, transportation. Jesus commissioned us. He said, go. Go into the world. And Elijah was in that cave. And you know why? Because he was afraid. And you know what the devil uses? He uses those phobias and those fears and those insecurities, and he tries to change us in, from what God made us to be and what Jesus restored us to be when we were baptized into Christ and we were reborn in the image of Jesus Christ, born again, and he wants to cast us as some fearful old person that we're afraid of and we can't get the victory that we need in our life. And Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, woe is me. And and God said, Elijah, just shut up. Get out of that cave and get back to work. There are 7,000 people here who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Get up and start preaching. And get out and start evangelizing. You know, when we get out of our cave and shake off the the phobias of the devil, we can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But you've got to make up your mind. We're going to serve God. We're going to quit living on the fence with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And we're going to give it all to God. You know, I'll tell you, there's a lot of regrets. Sports are, are so good because you see men that had regrets. There was a famous uh, boxing movie with Marlon Brando. and The punchline was something to the effect like, uh, here he hadn't trained as hard as he could have. And he didn't work as hard as he could have. And he didn't dedicate himself to the to the pugilistic profession, as they call it, as he could have. And, and he went into the fight, and he lost, and he realized in, that, in that, those final rounds that he could have won, but he had given up before the fight had begun, and he lamented to himself. He said, I could have been a contender. But he failed because he quit, and he gave up before the fight had begun. You know, there's a lot of Christians like that who have quit on God, and they've given up, and the battle hasn't even started. And I'll tell you, I can't imagine the worst regret is to walk away from any contest, a sporting contest, 
knowing that you hadn't given your best. I remember growing up, my parents, my father, my coaches would tell me, John, I want you to leave everything on that mat. Don't walk off that wrestling mat knowing that you still held some energy, knowing that you still had held something back. You come off that mat knowing that you expended everything you had. You know what was so ironic, so funny? I, I'm, I'm told this happens to the runners. Many races are, are won or lost in the beginning, surprisingly. There are a lot of races are won at the end, but there are some races that are won and lost in the beginning. Somebody who's trying to run and, and hold something back, and they're trying to hold back a reserve because they think they're going to expend it all at the end of that race, at the end of that fight. And what we find out about the body is that there's that second burst of energy that you have. And that if you just expend it, your cup would be refilled. There's always a second wind that a, that a runner has. And it's true in boxing. It's true in wrestling. You have that second wind that you didn't know you had. And let me tell you, that's something like what Paul said. He says, though the outer man perishes, yet the inner man is renewed day by day. And the Holy Spirit, just when we think we can't have anything more to give, you pour out what little you have. And you know what, beloved? God will fill that cup right back up. They had unity of mind. They had the resolution. But, but there's something without which we will never succeed. They had preparation. You have to prepare. Have you ever noticed there are some people in life that just uh, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence? We were driving out in Rockingham County, uh, out in the farmland, out and uh, just uh, going out for a country ride. And I had my camera, my video camera, and we were just driving slow through the farmland. And there we came across this cow, and his neck was stuck in the fence. I didn't know if he'd get out. I thought, honey, we might have to call that farmer. That, that cow needs help. And why was that cow's neck? I mean, he was stuck all the way up to his shoulders. I'm sure he got out. You know how cows are and barbed wire. You know the business. There was some grass that apparently, in, in that cow's little mind, his little brain, his feeble brain that he couldn't wrap around, there was a little patch of grass that apparently had a little more chlorophyll than that in his pasture. And I thought, isn't that just like us today, us Christians? We're all, it's always better somewhere else. It's always greener. If we could just go over here, if we could just go over there. You know, there's a lot of Christians like tumbleweed, and they just go wherever the wind blows. A tumbleweed gets moisture not through roots. It gets it through its stem. And so the wind can blow the tumbleweed, if you've ever seen some of those Western movies, you know, blowing around. And there's a lot of Christians like tumbleweed, you know, thinking if we can just go here, go there, you know, then we'll get blessed. The Bible doesn't picture in, in Proverbs chapter 1 a solid Christian in the Lord as a tumbleweed. He's like a tree. And I would to God that we were like trees. Because the tree gets his roots down. I like to think of an oak. I mean, it's hard to imagine a, a tougher, stronger tree than an oak tree, isn't it? If we could just get our roots down. You like gardening, right? You've got to prepare the soil. Maybe there's a reason why that grass looks so green. Somebody cultivated it. Somebody put fertilizer down. Jesus, when he came to the tree, and they were going to cut it down because it bore no fruit. And there, there's a typological lesson here. There's a reason. But it said, Jesus says, don't cut that tree down. Let's give it three years. We're going to put manure around it. We're going to put fertilizer down and see if we can't rejuvenate that tree. Beloved, isn't God good? How many of us have been like a dead tree? And yet, the manure and the fertilization of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God and the waters of God's blessings, we've been able to bear fruit. Don't put your hand up, but how many of us have been there? We've been dried up, we've been no good to the Lord, and with God's grace, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, and maybe with the help of a godly husband, a godly wife, godly friends, and the fellowship, that's why the fellowship is so important. That's why we want to have a little, little shindig at the Dowdy home tonight, and everybody's invited. What time does it start? Four o'clock, that's what I thought. Just wanted to confirm it. Preparation. Preparation. Can't wait until it's the moment of truth. You've got to prepare. 
I like to drive down 81 in my car and I have these thoughts going through my head. What do I want to preach? What do I want to say? You know, what am I going to, what am I going to, if I were ever called to give a defense for the Lord, if, even uh, before somebody, what would I say? And so I like to kind of preach out loud in my car while I'm by myself. And the other day I was back in my bedroom and I, I had that thought and that I wanted to just practice and professing and proclaiming and somebody came back and says, Dad, are you talking to yourself? Who are you talking to back here? Nobody, I'm just... I'm just thinking out loud. Preparation. The Lord wants us to prepare. Look at that. Even if he, he doesn't rescue us, we will never serve you. How were those three men able to come up with such a great answer, a great defense, a great apologetic for the Lord? They were prepared, weren't they? Prepared. Always prepared. Don't need a compass. Don't need a knapsack. Jesus said, uh, don't even provide for your journey. Don't take a walking stick. You don't need that. Just launch out on faith. God will take you as you go. He'll prosper you as you go. Preparation. Now we talked about Daniel 1. There's three stories I'm putting together. I want you to know that. Remember how they tried to get him to eat? Actually, God gave these men favor. We're back to Daniel, and I would assume if it happened to Daniel, what happened to the three men? Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now look at verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. You see how that works? I like what Michael Rodriguez said. It's not Las Vegas. You pull the slot, cherry, cherry, cherry. Woo-hoo! All the change. It's not a slot machine. It's not a lottery. Playing the lottery, it's not in the Bible. I don't think a man of Proverbs would do it. I think it's better to sow our seeds and work our land and, you know, what God has given us, what talents, use them. Uh, I don't like chance. I don't, there was a God of chaos, the God of good luck. He, to the Greeks, chaos. It's where we get our word chaos. There was a God of chaos. And they would worship the God of chaos. They would throw dice. I don't want to live by a die or by dice. But I'll tell you, I do want to live by grace. Look at that. If I believe that if we would just have that self-control, that purpose of heart, the preparation of being faithful in the little things, showing up for Sunday school, showing up around the assembly, first day of the week, being faithful to those little things, I believe we would have grace. God would give us grace. He would give us favor and sympathy if we'd be exercised self-control in our lives. Look at that. God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. And you see, beloved, how it works? Not just favor between God and man, but favor with the boss. Now, how much is that worth? Favor with our bosses. You say, John, that's impossible. The Bible says nothing's impossible with God. Look at Joseph. I mean, you talk about sexual harassment at the workplace. We just read the story of what happened to Joseph down in Genesis. He got harassed by the boss's wife and ended up in prison. Yeah, you know the rest of the story. Joseph said, God has made me like a god, like a, with a little g, to Pharaoh. He was the interpreter of dreams. He was the giver of bread. You see, God not only gave her to Joseph with himself, but he gave Joseph favor with his superiors. How much is that worth? It all boils down to this. Daniel said to the guard, you see the list, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, those were their true Jewish names. You see the name Yah. When you see Yah, I-A-H, that's Yahweh, the name of Yah, the Lord. You see the, word, the root El, Elohim. You see their real names. I mean, if anybody had an inferiority complex, if anybody had an identity complex, it was these guys, Daniel, Mishael, Shadrach, Abednego. Isn't that funny? We know them by Shadrach, Abednego, Meshach, the, the Babylonian names. But you know what Daniel said? He says, Prove us. I love it in life. Don't you love it? When There's got to be a final verdict. 
There's got to be a test that we pass or fail. We were down in Richmond. They were, the lawmakers were questioning whether, you know, some homeschool students should go to public school. And uh, really, uh, I was listening to the arguments, the delegates. They had everybody there, the Education Association, the PTAs. I was so amazed. And some of the things that they were talking about. Guess what? The mystery would be revealed. The answer to our prayer would come through. And after we get an answer to prayer, what did Daniel do? He just praised God of heaven. When's the last time we just praised the Lord? Just said, God, to you be the glory. I just feel like exalting. Not exalting, but exalting with a you. Giving God the exaltation. And here's what Daniel said. He said, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes the times and seasons. He sets up kings. He deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. Light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. You know, when Daniel gets, the, Daniel gets uh, the credit, guess what he's trying to do? He's trying to spread it out. Not only did you make no, it known to me, you've made it known to us. His three friends, all of Israel, God is going to bless if they would just hold on. You know, the Bible says, don't be weary in doing well. Don't be weary in doing well. Don't quit. You hold on. You know, they threw those three men into the fiery furnace for not bowing down. Nebuchadnezzar was angry. He was in a rage. Of course, you know the end of the story. He looked in and he said, how many men did we throw in there? Three men? Yeah, three guys. There's a fourth man in there, and he looks like the Son of God. I believe that was Jesus walking in the fire with those three men, and they were not burned, their hair was not singed, And they didn't smell like smoke. I can't start a fire in my backyard with a youth group without, you know, singeing the hairs on my hands and my eyebrows. I can't walk out of 7-Eleven without smelling like I've been to a smokehouse. You know, they don't even let them smoke, but they're smoking out in the street. They walk in, let out their breath, and you smell like a smokehouse, you know, coming out of the convenience store. Can you imagine coming out of the fiery furnace, not being burnt, not smelling like smoke? That's incredible. Let me tell you. When we come out of God's fire, His glory shines. And He knows it, and we know it, and the world knows it. You see, listen to what Nebuchadnezzar said. I don't want to hear what you say about yourself. I don't want to hear about what our family, our friends, my wife. How about what the enemies say? Every one of us has enemies, don't they? Do you have an enemy in the Lord? If you don't have an enemy in the Lord, what good is that? You've got to have some enemies or else you're not, you're not walking with God if you don't have an enemy. Isn't that what James says? Friendship with the world is enmity to God. If you're a friend of the world, you'll have God as your enemy. But if you're a friend of God, you'll have the world as your enemy. So you've got to be careful when you have too many worldly friends. If you understand what I'm trying to say. You see what Nebuchadnezzar said? He was angry. He was enraged. And now, after that miracle that God wrought... Listen to what he said. Praise be, indeed, to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him. They defied the king's command, my command, yeah, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. You know, isn't that what the Lord was asking? The day we came forward to obey the gospel, in faith and belief and repentance, in our baptism. Isn't that what the Lord was really asking, that we would give up our life? Are we willing to give up our lives and follow Jesus? Anywhere He leads me, I will safely go. Isn't that what the song says? In this world of darkness, through a world of woe, did we really give up our life to Jesus the day we came forward to die in our sins and be buried and to be raised. Didn't we pledge our lives? 
Didn't Paul tell the Corinthians that your body is not your own? You, you are now, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're not your own. Now you belong to the Lord. You were bought with a price. Isn't that what Paul was saying? They were willing to lose their lives. You know what Jesus said, beloved? He says, if you seek to save your own life, what did he say? You're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will gain it. Not only will you gain your life. Do you know what Jesus said? Not only will you gain your life, but you're going to be promoted. You see the promotion that that the three men got? And you know what Jesus told Peter? After that great discourse about the rich hardly getting to heaven, and Jesus said, well, with God all things are possible, Peter said, Lord, we have left all. We're not like the rich man that loved his riches and sadly walked away. We have given it all. We've given it up. I don't know where Peter's wife was. You know, Peter had a wife, don't you? He had a mother-in-law. I know, you know, people say he's a pope. You can't, you can't be a priest if you're not married. You know, Peter was the first pope. Peter had a wife. He had a mother-in-law. I can't imagine having a mother-in-law without a wife. I feel sorry for Peter's wife. Peter, we have no food. There's no food in the refrigerator. We need some fish. Where are you going? Uh, honey, i got to go with the Lord. What? I mean, Paul was kind of funny. He says, uh, don't I have liberty? I'm an apostle. I could be like Peter and carry around a wife. You've got to read into it. Paul, you know, he was a bachelor. He said, I could be like Peter and carry around a wife. I'm just having a little fun. I'll bet Peter's wife was just as sold out for Jesus as was he. Some things here that Jesus, that Jesus told Peter belong to the apostles. Jesus said to them, speaking of the apostles, Truly I say to you, you who follow the, me and the Son of Man, when he sits on his glorious throne, you shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That belongs to the apostles. Twelve thrones. He was speaking to the twelve. And, of course, Judas' place was given to Matthias. But verse 29 applies, and verse 30 applies to every one of us. He says, and everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, lands, farms, for my name's sake, will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But the first shall be last, the last shall be first. Matthew chapter 19 corresponds with Mark chapter 10. In Mark, Jesus adds one more thought. He says in Mark 10, 29 and 30, he says you'll be given houses and lands. Uh, I'm sorry, he says you'll be given a hundredfold. You know what a hundredfold means? That means a hundred X. They had algebra back in those days. A hundred X. Mark adds these words. In this life, and in the eternal life to come. Notice that? There's no millennial age in there. In this life, and in the eternal age to come. God will bless you. God will take care of you. We need to be like Daniel. Amen? Amen. Is there anybody out there who would like to be a Christian? Talk about decision making. Really, it could apply to anything. It could apply to your life. It could apply to your faithfulness, your fruitfulness. Is there anybody that would like to give a testimony? Maybe you are a Christian. Maybe somebody's backslidden and would like to be restored. Is there anybody that would like to give a testimony of what Jesus has done for their life?